let's jump out to New York uh, for our first call of the evening, and we'll talk with Matt. Hey, Matt, what do you got for us tonight, sir? How are you tonight, Pastor? Hey, great. What's on your mind? Well, yeah, I just recently read an author saying how, you know, the more revelation we get from God, the more we realize how much we don't know. Mm-hmm. And that kind of struck me uh, reading in uh, the sixth chapter of John and the issue, um, uh, the principle of election and predestination mm-hmm. came up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Jesus says in chapter six, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, mm-hmm. and I will raise you up on the last day. Mm-hmm. And so, and then and there's some other verses there. I know in, in later in the chapter he, he talks about that to his disciples who are unbelieving, and he says, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what I get from that is, is, first of all, the sovereignty of God, that, that before we, we have it in us, or at least we're conscious of our need for Christ, our desire for Christ, that desire comes from, from the Father who gives us, he draws that, and he puts that desire in us. So it brings me back to this whole issue, again, this, this concept of, of free will to choose. Maybe that's just a little overused cliche. So number one, the question is, in, again, and I'm sure you've answered this many times, to what extent do we actually have free will? And number two, the whole question of, well, if he's drawing certain people, that means he's not drawing other people. Um, I know in 2 Peter 3, 9, he talks about the Father does not wish to lose anybody. Uh, So I know that's in his heart. He doesn't want to lose anybody, but he knows. So I just wondered if you can help clear that up a bit. Sure, yeah. I think there's a huge misunderstanding around uh, John chapter 6, verse 44. Uh, We develop a doctrine, some of us, from a single verse Uh, You know, no one can come to me unless the Father uh, draws him. Well, you pop over to John uh, chapter 12, and what do you see there? He says, well, when the Son of Man is lifted up, uh, he will draw all people unto himself. So it's really important that we see uh, that there's this invitation, and yes, it's divinely enabled, uh, but who is the enabler? God is. And who is on his heart? The world is. Uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Um, Paul tells the Corinthians, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. And he begs you, he implores you, be reconciled to God. So who was it that God targeted? The world. Who is it that God so loved? The world. Uh, Who is it that the Father draws in John 12? He draws all people unto himself. Uh, You rightly quoted the Apostle Peter. Uh, God wants none to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants all to believe. So all of this comes together in a simple, straightforward message. Unfortunately, it's been convoluted and twisted uh, by those who frankly, have an entirely different message. I mean, the message out there that you'll hear quite often is, uh, how do you get saved? Well, only if you're picked. How do you get saved? Well, only if God lets you be saved. Um, And so it becomes about those who were pre-chosen and pre-selected. And quite frankly, if if that were the gospel, then nothing matters. Uh, We should shut down this radio program, shut down this station, Uh, shut down world missions, because it's all fated. I mean, if God has predetermined and pre-chosen certain people, then we could eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. It's all fated. God's got it all rigged, and therefore nothing matters. And the gospel is basically, hey, did he pick you? Hey, did he pick you? And by the way, how would you ever know you're picked? I mean, how would you ever know that you were one of the pre-chosen? You can't prove it. Is it a feeling? What if you lose that feeling? What if you wanted to be picked, but you weren't picked? What if you didn't want to be picked, but you were picked? I mean, this this is a funny doctrine uh, that the early church did not buy into. It's amazing to me that, you know, 1,500 years after Christ, There's a gentleman by the name of Calvin who starts uh, sharing some of these ideas, and we've created an ism, we've created a movement out of it, and we've essentially created a gospel out of it. And all the while, 
The word predestination, the way that it's used in Romans, it has to do with God, you know, starting a good work in you and carrying you on to completion. He's predestined you to be conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, That's just growth, and that's true for any of his children. If you're in Christ, you're predestined to grow. So what? That doesn't mean that certain people are picked for heaven and others are picked for hell. Uh, You know, this whole thing has been twisted and warped. And likewise, in the book of Ephesians, it's a you plural that were predestined. Uh, Paul's point is we Jews were chosen. We Jews were God's chosen people. And y'all also now have been predestined. In other words, y'all Ephesians, plural. In other words, y'all Gentiles. And that's why he says, you who were far off and we who were near and we who were the first to hope in Christ and now you who were basically the second to hope in Christ. uh, He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. And so the true meaning of predestination in Ephesians is that God has unleashed the gospel on the Gentiles. That was God's predestined plan that, hey, you Romans and you Ephesians and you Galatians and you Philippians, through the Apostle Paul, you're going to get the gospel. You're going to be invited to the table to feast on the goodness of this God that you weren't even looking for. You didn't know Yahweh from a hole in the wall. You had no covenant, no hope. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. But God intervened with his predestined plan, and he began to draw all people, not just the Jews, but he began to draw all people unto himself. And now, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. God doesn't want anyone to perish. That is the truth of the gospel. This other thing about individual selection, that God is up in heaven sort of randomly picking people, Uh, It's just not the truth, and it's not based on Scripture. It's based on an ism that was developed about 1,500 years after those epistles were written. The early church did not preach and teach individual selection, and there is a reason for that, because John 3.16 shouts from the rooftops, For God so loved the world. And Corinthians tells us God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And John the Baptist, what did he say about Jesus? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's the invitation for anyone to call upon the Lord and be saved. So I hope that helps, my friend. As far as uh, free will, I mean, free will is not a term in the Bible. I think we can toss that in the garbage and just recognize that we're always influenced by something. Uh, We start out as slaves of sin. uh, Then we're in Christ. We're slaves of righteousness. Uh, We're always influenced. And so free will, I mean, that's just a made-up term. It really comes down to the Plato-Socrates debate You know, those Greek orators who would sit in the city centers and debate fate versus free will. And it's no coincidence this comes up in your question, because if we're not careful today, we the church, we the body, the bride of Christ, we are reenacting. We are literally replaying those debates between Plato and Socrates about fate and free will. And I think God is just sort of looking at it going, huh. They've missed it. They've missed the whole thing. Uh, So, you know, at the end of the day, it's about Jesus and him being lifted up, him calling upon all, anyone and everyone, and whoever believes, well, uh, they can be saved. That's a beautiful truth that sets you free. Thanks for your call tonight. Reach out to us again anytime, Matt. Great to hear from you.